Hey everybody, welcome back to our next video in the Dead Church series. Throughout this series, we've been talking about repentance, obedience, faith, and how all these things work together. A couple of videos ago, I was talking about legalism and I was talking about the Pharisees. I read this verse from Matthew 15. Jesus answered, and why do you refuse to obey God's command for the sake of your traditions? You rejected the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You are hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people show honor to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is worthless. The things they teach are nothing but human rules. In this passage, and some passages just like it that I read in the earlier video, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he's saying, you guys have abandoned the things that God said to do. And instead you're just doing things that are human traditions. What's important for us in the church to look at is, are we like the Pharisees or are we like the early church? What does it mean to be a Christian? Or in other words, what are the things that a Christian should be doing to obey the commands of God? What should a Christian life look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Because we want to make sure that we are not like the Pharisees, replacing the things that God wants us to do with our own traditions, our own human traditions and rituals. Here are a few things that, as I grew up in the church and spent many years in the church, I thought this is what it meant to be a Christian. Going to church on Sunday. Reading my Bible in the mornings. Praying singing worship songs, whether on Sunday or in my own time, getting together with Christian friends to talk about God and the Bible, trying to not sin and getting better at not sinning, getting help from Christian friends with sins that I repeatedly struggled with, listening to or reading Christian teaching. That would be either sermons or books, tithing at least 10% of what I made, Memorizing some Bible verses, going on missions trips, serving in my church in some way, whether it be children's ministry, the sound team, the drama team, the greeting team, whatever it might be, and talking to unbelievers about Jesus. Now, this list is not exhaustive, but that was a general sense of what I felt like it meant to be a Christian. This is how I viewed the Christian life. These are the things that a Christian should generally be doing. And some of these things may be unique to the church that I grew up in, and some other churches might have things that are unique to them. But the point being, we have these things that we do today in church, in the Christian life, that we view as what a Christian should look like. But what we want to look at is, are these the things that set a Christian apart from the world? Are these the things that the Bible says a Christian should be doing? Are these the things that make a Christian stand apart from an unbeliever? Are these things different than what the Pharisees were doing? In general, we get our idea of what a Christian should be from the culture around us. Our culture tells us this is what it means to be a Christian. And then when you do those things, you then say, okay, now I am a Christian. Okay, but here's the problem. All throughout the New Testament, the Bible is warning us that the church is going to have so many false Christians in it. These aren't warnings saying some people will be in the church who are false Christians. You got to watch out for them. These are warnings saying it's going to be all over the place. Many will be deceived. Jesus said the way is narrow that enters into life and few will find it. And the apostles said that many will be deceived and will go to destruction. They will think they're following the Lord and they will go to destruction. Jesus said many will call him Lord, Lord on that day. And he's going to say, I never knew you. Paul warns us in 2 Timothy 3 saying that the church is going to become full of all these people who aren't obeying God. We know he's talking about the church because he concludes that by saying, avoid these people. 
And in 1 Corinthians 5, he says that when he tells people to avoid certain people, he's not talking about people in the world. He's not talking about unbelievers. He's talking about those who call themselves brothers and sisters and yet do these things. So in 2 Timothy 3, he's saying the church is going to look like this. He's saying it's going to be terrible. The times will be terrible because the church is going to look like this. And he describes it as people will love themselves, they will love money, they will be disobedient, they will have this appearance of godliness, but they will lack the power. And many other things. He's saying the church is going to look terrible. This is coming. So here's the thing. When we determine what a Christian life should look like by looking at our culture, what if our culture has already turned from God like the apostles and Jesus said it would? What if our church culture has already become apostate? That's a word Paul uses in 2 Thessalonians 2 where he says, the day of the Lord, the day that Jesus returns, is not going to happen until the apostasy happens. That word apostasy essentially means falling away. Now there are some who debate whether or not this means falling away or it might mean something else. The fact is that The word apostasy was used throughout many Jewish writings in that day to refer to when Israel disobeyed God back in the Old Testament, to when Israel disobeyed God during the time of the Maccabees in the intertestamental period. The word apostasy was a very common word used in Jewish culture during Second Temple Judaism that always referred to the people abandoning God, disobeying him, and going the other way. There's no question what Paul was talking about there. It's the Greek word apostasia, which is the feminine form of the word apostasion, which Jesus used. It means divorce. Paul is saying that the church is going to divorce the bridegroom. If the church is the bride, Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is going to divorce him. They're going to leave him. They're going to commit adultery. He's saying the day of the Lord, the day Jesus returns, will not come until this happens. The Bible is saying there is going to be this time where the church has abandoned Jesus. The church has abandoned what Jesus taught. The church is disobeying him. The church is not even what he established. If this is going to happen, we can't determine what a Christian life should look like by looking at our culture around us. Because it might have already happened. The apostles are all warning us throughout the New Testament that we need to not be deceived. In fact, they even tell us that we should not determine whether or not we are right with God by judging ourselves against those around us. This is what Paul said. If anyone thinks he is important when he really is not, he's only deceiving himself. Each person should examine his own actions and not compare himself with others. Then he can be proud for what he himself has done each person will carry their own load. So Paul is saying, don't examine yourself based on those around you. Look at yourself. Look at your own actions. Is what you are doing lining up with what the Bible teaches? Is what you're doing lining up with what Jesus and the apostles taught? Paul also says this, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. They use themselves to measure themselves, and they judge themselves by what they themselves are. What fools! Then a few verses later, he says, It is not those who commend themselves who are approved, but those the Lord commends. So here, Paul is saying that people are coming along and they're measuring themselves by themselves. They're using themselves as the standard of measurement, and then they're saying, Look, I meet the standard. And he's like, that's ridiculous. He calls them fools. But we do the same thing in the church today. We created this culture of Christianity and then we use it as our measuring stick. So then when we live up to the culture we created, we pretend that we are approved by God. But Paul's saying, no, only the one that the Lord commends is actually commended. You're only approved if the Lord approves you. Not if your culture approves you. Not if the Christian church around you approves you. So it doesn't matter if you look like all the Christians around you. What matters is, do you look like what Jesus says a Christian should look like? Here's another example. 
In Revelation 3, Jesus writes this letter to the church in Sardis. This is what he says. I know your works. You have a reputation that you are alive, but really you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what you have left, which is about to die. I have found that what you are doing is less than what my God wants. So remember what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. So Jesus is writing this letter to Sardis saying, you have this reputation that you're alive. Everyone thinks that you are alive, that you are exactly what God is looking for, but you are actually dead. Now tell me, if you were someone in the church of Sardis, and you're looking around at the culture around you, they all have this reputation of being alive, and you're comparing yourself to them, you're going to think you're alive too. But Jesus says you're dead. If you're comparing yourself to the culture around you, you might not know that you're dead when you're really dead. This verse here, this letter that Jesus wrote to Sardis is where we get the name of our series, Dead Church. Because the modern church is comparing itself to those around us. We are looking at ourselves and saying that we're approved by God because we look like the culture around us. The culture around us, the church around us, has this reputation of being alive, but it's dead. We need to know what the Bible says it means to be a Christian, what the Bible says it means to be alive. Because here's the thing, all these things I listed out earlier that we tend to think it means to be a Christian, all these things that we look at the Christian life and we say it should look like this, that doesn't actually look any different than the Pharisees. Let's go through this. We think that a Christian should go to church on Sundays. This isn't really any different than the Pharisees getting together every Sabbath day at their synagogues. They got together in order to read the Bible, to teach the Bible, to sing songs to God. They did the exact same thing. The Pharisees were going to church on Sunday in a manner of speaking. You got to remember, Judaism was not something that God saw as evil. God established Judaism through Moses. When the Pharisees were getting together and reading the Bible, they were doing that as God's people. They were doing that reading the law of God, reading the same scriptures we have, worshiping the same God we worship. We believe that a Christian should read the Bible. We talk about having your quiet times or having your devotionals or many different ways that Christians phrase it. We talk about getting up in the morning and reading your Bible. We talk about it like when you read your Bible, you're getting strength for the day. You read the Bible and you get life from it. But this is what Jesus said about the Pharisees. You carefully study the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. They do in fact tell about me, but you refuse to come to me to have that life. So Jesus is saying that the Pharisees are carefully studying the scriptures. They're carefully reading the Bible. They spent a lot of time reading the Bible and they did it because they thought it gave them life. Reading the Bible doesn't give you life. You have to come to Jesus to have life. And the rest of scripture explains what it means to come to him. So if you're getting up in the morning and you're reading your Bible, that still doesn't make you any different than what the Pharisees did. That still doesn't set you apart from the people that Jesus was condemning. We talk about singing worship songs. We talk about you got to come and you got to sing worship songs and praise God. But again, this was no different than the Pharisees. The Pharisees would sing the Psalms that David wrote. They would get together and they would sing worship songs to God. In fact, this is something that was practiced all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout Israel. Even when Israel was in complete rebellion to God, they still thought they were following God in the Old Testament. When God sent the prophets to Israel in the Old Testament, much of the time he was saying, I'm about to punish you guys. You guys have become evil in my sight. And we read that and we think that, oh yeah, these people had completely abandoned God. But that's not their perspective. That's God's perspective. The people thought they were still obeying God. They thought they were still worshiping God. And so just because we come and we sing songs to God and we sing worship songs doesn't actually mean anything. This is what God said about their worship songs. 
The Lord says, I hate and reject your feasts. I cannot stand your religious meetings. If you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. You bring your best fellowship offerings of fattened cattle, but I will ignore them. Take your noisy songs away from me. I won't listen to the music of your harps. So God is telling them, you guys are coming to me. You're having these religious meetings. You're singing songs. You're bringing me sacrifices. I don't care. I don't want your sacrifices. I hate your meetings and I won't listen to your songs. So then, if we're thinking that the Christian life looks like coming and having these religious meetings on Sunday, these church meetings where we pray, where we sing songs, nothing about that is different than what they were doing in Israel before God destroyed them with Babylon. God hated what they were doing. And he goes on to explain why. But we need to understand that that in and of itself is not what the Christian life is supposed to look like. It's not wrong to come to God and pray. It's not wrong to come to him and sing worship songs. We absolutely should. But in and of itself, that's not obedience to God. A lot of times we think that being a Christian means we talk about God and we talk about the Bible. But the Pharisees talked about God and they talked about the Bible. Jesus was always talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were the teachers of the law. They were the ones who taught the Old Testament. They prided themselves on the fact that they knew God better than anybody else. And they were the ones who were always talking about God and talking about the Bible. Talking about God and talking about the Bible does not make you a Christian. A lot of times we think that being a Christian means listening to sermons, whether it be on Sunday or maybe in our free time. We download something online and we listen to a sermon. But again, that's no different than the Pharisees. They were always listening to teaching. They would gather together all the time and teach the scriptures and listen to all the teaching of the rabbis. What we do today is no different than what the Pharisees were doing. They also listened to teaching on scripture. So that doesn't set us apart either. We think it's important to tithe. We say it's important that a Christian comes and tithes at least 10%. But this is what Jesus said about the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You are hypocrites. You pay tithe on everything you have, even your mint, dill, and cumin. But you ignore the really important teachings of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These are the things you should do without neglecting those other things. Blind guides, you are like a person who picks a fly out of a drink and then swallows a camel. Okay, so the Pharisees paid tithe far more diligently than even we do. They paid tithe on everything they had, their mint, their dill, their cumin. I mean, they're literally growing herbs and paying tithe on those herbs. We just say you got to pay tithe on your income. How often do you tithe 10% of the tomatoes you're growing in your garden? The Pharisees would have tithed on that. So tithing doesn't set us apart. If anything, we don't tithe as well as the Pharisees did. We think that a Christian should be memorizing scripture, or at least a lot of people do. But the Pharisees had scripture memorized far better than we do. Back then, they could quote entire books of the Bible from memory. We can quote two or three verses Memorizing scripture doesn't set us apart. Heck, even when Jesus was in the wilderness, Satan was quoting scripture. Okay, Satan himself has Bible verses memorized. That does not make us a Christian. So far, none of these things set us apart at all from the Pharisees or from ancient Israel that was judged, or even some of these things don't even set us apart from Satan himself. And yet these are the things that we think it means to be a Christian. We go on missions trips. I went on missions trips. I went to Mexico at least once a year for many years, going to this orphanage in Mexico and helping them build some buildings and put up a fence for security and paint some walls and hanging out with my friends in our free time and getting to know new people. We think that going on a missions trip is something that a Christian should be doing. 
But the Pharisees did that too. They went out and they were trying to reach the people. They went out and they were trying to do things. Jesus said this about them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You are hypocrites. You travel across land and sea to make one convert. When you find that person, you make him more fit for hell than you are. Jesus is saying the Pharisees are traveling across land, they're traveling across sea to go find converts. But then when they do, they're making that convert more fit for hell than they are. Going on missions trips doesn't make you any different than anyone in any other religion. People go on missions trips. People go and they travel to do things for their religion. That's not what defines a Christian. The Pharisees did that too. Just because you're evangelizing doesn't mean that that convert is going to get to heaven. Not unless you're actually preaching what scripture teaches. And we think we're preaching what scripture teaches because we're teaching what the church told us that scripture teaches. How do we know that we're not just like the Pharisees? We're going and we're making a convert and that convert is now twice as fit for hell as we are. Evangelizing in and of itself is not what makes us Christian. Does that mean we shouldn't do it? No, but it doesn't make us Christian. We think that a Christian life should look like serving in our local church, whether it be in children's ministry or greeting team, or I was on the drama team when I was at the church. But the reality is when we're doing those things, all we're really doing is helping our religious meeting function. We need someone to watch the kids. We need someone to teach the kids, so we have a drama team come in and teach. We need uh, someone to do the sound so we can have these microphones and these speakers and so we can hear everybody, so we get a sound team. Oh, well, all these people are coming in the doors. We want to be greeting them. Let's get a greeting team. These are just functions of a religious meeting, and the Pharisees did the same. They gathered together, they had meetings, and they had people who were responsible for helping that meeting function correctly. That's no different than what we do today. Serving in our local meetings is no different than the Pharisees doing things in their synagogues to make sure the meeting functioned properly. It doesn't set us apart. Christians talk about we need to try not to sin. We need to not sin or try not to sin. We need to get help with our sin. But here's the thing. Yes, Christians need to not be sinning. That's taught very clearly throughout the New Testament in stronger words than I've ever heard at a Protestant church. Paul says this, The works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, taking part in sexual sins, idolatry, doing witchcraft, hating, making trouble, being jealous, rage, being selfish, making people angry with each other, causing divisions among people, feeling envy, being drunk, having wild and wasteful parties, and doing other things like these. I warn you now as I warned you before, those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says again, But there must be no hint of sexual sin among you, or any kind of impurity or greed. Those things are not right for God's holy people. Also, There must be no evil talk among you, and you must not speak foolishly or tell evil jokes. These things are out of character. Instead, you should be giving thanks to God. For you can be sure of this. No one will have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God who sins sexually or does evil things or is greedy. Anyone who is greedy is serving a false god. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul says, Everyone who wants to belong to the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Okay, so what Paul is saying in these verses, and these are just a few snippets from many other verses in the New Testament that say the same thing. He's not saying, in general, you should just try to not do these things, but it's okay and you have forgiveness if you do. That's not what he's saying. He is writing to Christians and telling them, no one who does these things will inherit the kingdom of God. And these are not the only verses in the New Testament. Hebrews 10 says that if you deliberately go on sinning, you have nothing left except a terrifying expectation of judgment. John says in 1 John 3, anyone who continues to sin belongs to the devil because the devil's been sinning since the beginning. 
the Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's work. All who are God's children do not continue sinning, because God's seed abides in them. They are not able to go on sinning, because they have become children of God. Over and over again, Scripture is teaching that if you go on sinning, you cannot get into the kingdom of God. So already, Scripture is holding up a higher standard than what most of the Protestant church teaches. The Protestant church teaches that, in general, you need to not be sinning, but if you do sin, remember you have forgiveness. That's not what Scripture teaches. Scripture is saying you need to turn from sin. That's what repentance means. You turn from sin. Okay, then this is a bigger topic for another time. But here's my point. There are people in the church who say you need to turn from sin. There are people who talk about this. They say you need to stop being sexually immoral. You need to stop being a drunkard and many other things. But what is missed by these people who talk about these things is that that is not the fullness of repentance. Repentance is not just stop sinning. The Pharisees prided themselves on the fact that they didn't commit adultery. They didn't commit sexual immorality. They didn't break God's law. They were very good about not doing the things that God said not to do. The Pharisees were very proud of the fact that they were really good about not breaking those laws. Repentance is not just about not doing the things God says not to do. That is what is very often missed in the church today. When Christians talk about how we need to no longer be sinning, they're not getting the whole message of repentance. If you completely stop sinning, if you completely stop doing the things that God says not to do, but you don't start doing the things that God says you should be doing, you haven't repented. In fact, you probably just don't understand how you are still sinning. You don't understand what it means when it says, don't love yourself or don't love money. You think you don't love money because you use the world standards. You don't use God's standards. You think you don't love yourself because you use the world standards, not God's standards. If you don't begin to do the things that God says to do, you haven't repented and you're still no different than the Pharisees. Okay, so with all of these things, we look at the Christian life and we say it should look like these things. And yet none of those things separate us from the Pharisees or ancient Israel before they were judged by God. None of those things. There's nothing about what we think of the Christian life that makes us any different than the people that God said, you're guilty. And we think, well, we believe in Jesus. The Bible doesn't preach that you're saved by believing in Jesus. It preaches that you're saved by fidelity. In Greek, the word that's translated faith is pistis. It's also often the root of the word that's translated believe. So when we talk about being saved by believing or believers or being an unbeliever, or if we talk about having faith, it's that word pistis. And that word doesn't mean faith and it doesn't mean believe. It always meant both believing and obeying. It meant believing something is true so much that it changes your life. It really most clearly means fidelity, like a husband and a wife. It's faithfulness. And we talk about this in depth in an earlier video in the series. You can see that right here. So we're not saved by just believing in Jesus. So we can't look at our lives and say, we do all the same things the Pharisees do, but we believe in Jesus. Because that doesn't separate us from the Pharisees. The Bible clearly teaches that we need to change the way we're living. That's what repentance means. It doesn't just mean we stop doing bad things. We have to start doing the things that God wants us to be doing. Repentance is not just about don't do these things. This whole list of things that Paul says, no one who does these things will inherit the kingdom of God. That is absolutely true. You cannot go through life and continue to do those things. But if all you do is try to stop doing those things, you haven't repented. Because repentance is about you stop doing the things God says not to do, and you start doing the things God says you should do. And so we need to understand what are those things that we should be doing. Because we can see that what we think of as the Christian life is no different than the Pharisees. It's no different than ancient Israel. There's nothing about that that God said that is approved. These are all things that We've adopted 
as culture. Our culture tells us this is what it means to be a Christian. But the Bible tells us the church culture is going to start getting it very wrong. And so if we define what it means to be a Christian by our church culture, we're very likely going to be one of those ones that the Bible says they're deceived and they're led into destruction. Our church culture travels across land and sea to make one convert. But they make that convert twice as fit for hell as they are. We don't want to be that convert that's twice as fit for hell because we followed the traditions of men, because we followed human teachings and human rules. We followed human traditions. The church has become a bunch of Pharisees. We follow human traditions and we ignore the commands of God. Our lives are defined by church meetings and prayer meetings and Bible studies. It's not defined by obeying the commands of God. In fact, we're taught in the Protestant church that we don't need to obey the commands of God. We're saved by faith without works. Our very definition of what it means to be a Christian is wrong. And that means that those who are living that way, living underneath that definition, are not Christians. We need to stop defending the apostate church, the false church, and treating it like it's the holy temple of God when it's not. Because only those who obey Jesus are saved. Only those who obey the commands of God are saved. And that's what we see clearly taught in Scripture. Here are some examples. Jesus said this, Everyone who hears my words and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on rock. It rained hard, the floods came, and the winds blew and hit that house. But it did not collapse because it was built on rock. Everyone who hears my words and does not obey them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. It rained hard, the floods came, and the winds blew and hit that house. And it collapsed with a big crash. We've talked about this parable earlier in the series, but the thing to keep noting is that it's not those who have the words of Jesus. It's those who obey the words of Jesus. He doesn't say the wise man is the man who has the Bible and reads the Bible daily and goes to church and listens to sermons. No, he says the wise man is the one who has my words and obeys it. And the foolish man is the man who has my words and does not obey it. So the only difference between the wise man and the foolish man is whether or not they obey what Jesus says. Now, John talks about obeying the commands of God clearer than anywhere else in Scripture. John says this in 1 John, We can be sure that we know God if we obey His commands. Anyone who says, I know Him, but does not obey His commands, is a liar and the truth is not in that person. But if someone obeys his word, then in that person, God's love has truly reached its goal. This is how we can be sure we're in him. Whoever says that he abides in him must live as Jesus lived. John says again, the world and its desires are passing away, but the person who does what God wants lives forever. John says again, 1 John 3, 22, and God gives us what we ask for because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. In verse 24, he says, The people who obey God's commands abide in God, and God abides in them. Abiding in God is not about having this feeling. It's not about praying. It's not about reading the Bible. John says, The ones who obey him abide in him, and he abides in them. That's what it means to abide in him. When Jesus says, Abide in me, and I will abide in you, he's talking about obedience. We'll keep reading what John says. Loving God means obeying his commands. And God's commands are not too burdensome for us. Okay, so John is saying that obedience to God is what dictates whether or not we know him. We can be sure that we know God if we obey his commands. Those who abide in God are the ones who obey his commands. Those who have eternal life are the ones who do what God wants. The New Testament talks about how we've been adopted by God. We can call him Abba, Father. What that means is that we are now in his family. We are now brothers and sisters with Jesus himself. Scripture teaches this very clearly. And the church is very well aware of this, that we become part of God's family. Jesus becomes our brother. We are brothers and sisters with him. Paul says we are co-heirs with Christ. But this is what Jesus says. He doesn't say everyone who believes in me 
is my brother and my sister. Jesus says this, My mother and my brothers and sisters are those who listen to God's teaching and obey it. Okay, so Jesus isn't saying, my family are those who believe in me. He's saying, my family are those who hear God's teaching and they obey it. This is the same thing John is saying. This is the same thing he, Jesus said about the parable of the wise man and the foolish man. All throughout scripture, it's talking about obeying the commands of God. So what are the commands of God? Like, as we've been discussing in this video, if all we're doing are the same things the Pharisees are doing and ancient Israel did before they were judged, there's nothing that separates us. God was condemning them because they were not obeying the commands of God as well. So obviously, those things are not the commands of God. And if all we're trying to do is not do the things God says not to do, we're not obeying the commands of God. Jesus talks about doing the word of God, not just not doing the things that God says not to do. So what are the commands of God? Well, John in 1 John talks about obeying the commands of God clearer than anywhere else in scripture. And he actually says it very clearly. This is what John says. As for you, be sure you abide in the teaching you heard from the beginning. If you abide in what you heard from the beginning, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise which he himself promised to us, eternal life. So he's saying, if you abide in this teaching, you abide in the Son and in the Father. Elsewhere in the same book, he's saying, if you obey the commands of God, you abide in the Son and in the Father. Well, that means if you abide in this teaching, you are obeying the commands of God. The teaching you heard from the beginning. So what is that? Well, he tells us plainly. In 1 John 3, 11, he says, This is the teaching you have heard from the beginning. We must love each other. So John is saying, the teaching you've heard from the beginning is that we love each other. That's what it means to obey the commands of God. And this really is no different than what Jesus said. Repeatedly, Jesus said that all of the law and all of the prophets are summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He's saying all of the Old Testament is summed up in love, loving God and loving your neighbor. Paul said the same thing in Romans and in Galatians. He says that all of the law and all of the prophets are summed up in love your neighbor as you love yourself. So all of the Old Testament is summed up in love. And this is what Paul says about the New Testament, about what he wrote and the other apostles were writing. The purpose of our commands is for people to have love, a love that comes from a pure heart and a clear conscience and a genuine faith. Some people have missed these things and turned to meaningless discussion. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not understand either what they are talking about or what they so confidently assert. So, we know that the Old Testament is summed up in love, and Paul is saying that the New Testament, the commands that the apostles were giving, the purpose of them is love. So the Old Testament and the New Testament is all about love, and that's what John is saying. The teaching you've heard from the beginning is we must love each other. And we know that's true, too, because Jesus said this, This is my command. Love each other as I have loved you. He repeated this a few sentences later. This is my command. Love each other. So Jesus is saying, this is my command. Love each other. John is saying, the teaching you've heard from the very beginning is that we should love each other. Paul is saying, the purpose of our commands is love. So the commands that we're supposed to be following, the thing that's supposed to separate us from the Pharisees, from ancient Israel, the thing that's supposed to separate us from the world is love. We should love one another. And John clarifies this in 1 John. If you go and read it, he says this over and over again, that it's all about love. Love is what separates us. Love is what the Christian life is supposed to look like. It's not just you stop sinning. You also have to start loving. That was the message of John the Baptist in Luke 3. The message of the Bible, the message of the gospel, is that we need to be faithful to God's chosen one, Jesus. 
And being faithful to him means we obey his commands. And obeying his commands means loving one another. But here's the problem. Just like the church looks at what the Christian life should look like, and we determine what that should look like by looking at the world around us, by looking at the church around us, we do the same thing with the commands of God. We do the same thing with love. We see that scripture tells us we should love, and we determine what love means by accepting the world's definition of love. This is very similar to when we talked about repentance. We accept the world's definition of repentance. The world tells us repentance means feeling bad about what you did. But it actually means you change your action. You stop doing one thing and you start doing something else. We also read the Bible and we look at the word faith and we think we understand what the word faith is so we never do any research. But the Greek actually means not believing, but believing and obeying. Fidelity, loyalty, faithfulness. And the same is true with love. We see the Bible tells us to love and we just assume we know what that means and we don't even try looking into it. But if we accept the world's definition of love, then we're only loving the same way the world loves. But 1 John tells us, everyone who loves has become God's child and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. A few verses later, in verse 16, he says, God is love. Those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. That's very similar to earlier where we saw he says, if you obey God's commands, then you abide in God. Here he's saying it directly. If you love, you abide in God and God abides in you. But here's the thing. He's saying that no one can love unless they know God. No one can love unless they have become a child of God. So if we're using the world's definition of love, well, that doesn't make any sense. Because that means that everyone who is in the world who doesn't even call themselves a Christian has become a child of God. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So obviously, it's not talking about the world's definition of love. We need to understand what God's definition of love is. And the thing is, if we were willing to search for it, we would see that the Bible defines love. It clearly teaches us what love is and what love is not. But we go through life in the church today thinking that we are people who love and we don't. We love according to the world. We don't love according to God. We don't love in the way that we've been commanded to love. We don't love in the way that scripture says we should love. And therefore, we're not obeying the commands of God. We need to love as Jesus loved us. That's what he said in John 15. And that is a very different kind of love than what the world tells us love means. So in our next video, we're going to look at what does it mean to love one another? What is biblical love? Because we're supposed to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, but in order to do that, we need to know what that means. We need to stop assuming we know things. We need to stop coming to scripture, assuming that we've already got pieces of it figured out. We don't. Our definition, our human definition of love is nowhere near what God's expecting. So when we come and we just have feelings for each other, when we just have this human love, this worldly love, we're not obeying God. We're not obeying the commands of God. We don't abide in him. And according to what scripture teaches, if you're not obeying the commands of God, you don't have life. You don't have eternal life. You don't have salvation. And you haven't repented. It doesn't matter if you go to church. It doesn't matter if you read the Bible. It doesn't matter if you listen to sermons. It doesn't matter if you pray. It doesn't matter if you worship. It doesn't matter if you tithe. It doesn't matter if you go on missions trips. It doesn't matter if you try to stop sinning or even if you've convinced yourself that you have stopped sinning. It doesn't matter if you evangelize. It doesn't matter if you pray for the sick and have signs and wonders. That's one other thing. People think that obeying God, obeying the commands of Jesus means go heal the sick and cast out demons. Jesus did tell people to do that, yes. But he also said in Matthew 7 that many people will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we perform signs and wonders in your name? And he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
you who practice unrighteousness. He's saying you didn't obey the commands of God. You have to be obeying the commands of God. If you're not obeying the commands of God, you're not a Christian. That is what Scripture teaches. It's not what the church teaches, but it is what Scripture teaches. And Scripture tells us exactly what the commands of God are. It's not something we can just make up or come up with our own ideas of what we think God cares about. Scripture tells us what He cares about. It tells us what His commands are. It says His commands are to love. But that's not enough. It's not enough to just say, okay, we need to go love. We need to know what love means according to God. Because what if you use the devil's definition of love? Are you obeying God's commands then? No. You need to know what God says love is. He says you need to love, and he says this is what love is. And scripture teaches us what he says love is. And if you are not doing what he says love is, you are not obeying his commands, and that means you're not a Christian. So in our next video, we're going to talk about what does scripture tell us it means to love? What does it mean to love one another? And after that, we will begin to talk about what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because that's also what Jesus says the Old Testament is summed up in. And we need to understand what that means as well.